I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, even in the midst of the rain and the lightning. We are glad that you are here this morning. We invite you to stand as you are able and join us in singing hymn number 157, Jesus Shall Reign. If you would, please help me spread the word of Christ by greeting one another with the passing of the peace. If you have your hymnals with you, if you would, please turn to hymn number 579, 581. 581. 581. <laughs> yeah, we all make mistakes, don't we? <laughs> Lord, whose love through humble services.
You may be seated. I invite you to quiet your minds and to quiet your hearts as we go to God in prayer. God, we come into your presence this morning grateful for this time to worship you and to listen for what you have to say to us. You give us so much, God, and we are thankful. And one of the greatest gifts you have given us is the gift of prayer. We bring before you, Lord, the concerns weighing on our hearts. Touch the lives of all these people and situations and us with your healing love. Flood their lives and ours with hope, courage, direction, love, and your power. We've seen the news, and it's not hard to. You said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Reconciling God, proclaim peace to us once more. Put to death all hostility within us and help us to be one with our enemies, that we may all be members of your household. Remove the animosities to which we cling and be our shepherd, even as we are sheep of your pasture. Help us, gracious God, to be those people who are so confident and confident in your presence that we dare to step out in faith, to work for you in places of need and strife, to witness to your love in all that we do, proclaiming your presence with our mouths and our actions. Give us your guidance, your forgiveness, and courage to be at work in your kingdom. We ask these things in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Before we get started this morning, I have a few announcements to make. We have a family fun day happening this afternoon. God willing, in the creek don't rise. And uh, so after this service, if you have time and and uh, the ability, what, what we didn't tell you in your membership vows, it's kind of in the fine print that thou shalt move tables and chairs. Uh, we need help moving tables and chairs in Hildreth Hall. We're having a family fun day this afternoon starting at 5. We're going to have bounce houses and food. Uh, we invite anyone who wants to come and participate to come and be a part of that. It's going to be a great time. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of fun with the kids and the youth. And um, I just encourage you to be a part of that. And if you can help, we do ask that you please do. Uh, also, next Sunday, we're going to be taking the youth to a Wahoos game, but we have some extra tickets. So if any of you would like to go to the Wahoos game with us, we invite you to come and be with us. I will be there. Uh, a disclaimer, though, anything that I say at a ball field stays at the ball field. I am like the sandlot catcher. I love talking trash at ball games. So Lord, forgive me. It's a lot of fun, though. Uh, we're going to have a good time, though, with the youth and, and experiencing that ball game together. And then finally, my last announcement is an important one. The blood bus is coming to our church next Sunday. And so we encourage anyone who can and is able, uh, eat a good breakfast and, and help us as we seek to help those who are in the greatest need in our community. That gift really goes a long way. And we really do need your help to continue to be the kind of church that supports those who are in need. And it's a way we can give back to our community. So we please, please, please ask you to give blood next week and to help us to, to share hope in a world that sometimes always feels like it needs a little bit more of that. This morning, our sermon is going to be based on two different scriptures that kind of tie into the same theme. We're going to be in Psalm 23 and Mark chapter 6. And these two different stories are important for us, but... We're going to focus primarily on Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a, a very important scripture, not only for me, but, but so many people love it. I can tell you, uh, at a church that I served that had a preschool once, we, uh, we had chapel every week. And every week at chapel, those kids did three things. No matter what else they did, they did these three things. 
And we do something similar here where the kids learn all these things. But one of those things was we read Psalm 23 every week. And it was funny, we had Psalm 23 and there were screens and there were funny pictures of Psalm 23 anthropomorphized with all kinds of funny sheep. And the kids at the beginning of the year who could not read because they were two, three, and four would just listen. But by the end of the year, all these two, three, and four-year-olds were shouting the 23rd Psalm at the top of their voice because they wanted me to know that they knew it. They also said the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed. Those are things that people carry with them their whole life. And it was amazing to hear these, these little children profess their faith and to read Psalm 23 and then to say the Lord's Prayer. They didn't have everything they needed, but they had a good start, right? And so I think about this idea of Psalm 23. It's an important scripture. And it's an important scripture because it's one that comforts us even in the hardest moments. It's used almost at every funeral when everything is the bleakest and the hardest psalm 23 is read i can tell you you know it's one of those scriptures where when everything's going wrong it's a good one to have with you and so we're going to read it this morning and if you know it say it with me the lord is my shepherd i shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. Yea, you though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a beautiful psalm. But so often we only use it in the most dark moments. But I would say that this is a psalm we should carry with us even when things are good. It's amazing what this psalm is saying to us because it's a psalm of God's providence. It's a psalm that tells us not only what God is and who God is to us, but who we are to God. Because it begins with this word, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. It starts off with saying the Lord is our shepherd. That makes us sheep. And sheep are so smart. We're God's flock. The old hymn says prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. So there's this idea that we are like sheep. Sometimes we make boneheaded sheep decisions and walk down paths that are not good for us. Sometimes we wander away, but the Lord is our shepherd. Or as Jesus said, the good shepherd. And so it's this amazing understanding of who God is, that God is the shepherd that provides for us and we are his sheep and then it says, I shall not want. In other versions, it says, I shall lack nothing. Now, we are Americans. Americans want lots of things. We're a consumeristic society, and we're not unique. Most of the modern world is a consumeristic society. We don't really take a lot of things and hold them in high regard. We take a lot of things for granted. We always want the next thing. I don't know if you know that, but it's that consumerism that we're driven by. We always want the next thing. There's always something better and greater on the horizon. I remember vividly, Brittany did not realize how bad my addiction to buying guitars was when we first got married. And after Sophie was born, we, we had run into a little bit of extra cash and I said, baby, I need to go and buy a guitar string. She said, okay, we'll go to the guitar store when we go uh, to the store, when we go to the store this afternoon. And I remember I walked in and I found the guitar I wanted and I looked at it and I looked at her and I said, this has new strings on it. <laughs> she relented and let me buy a guitar. But now from, from there forward, anytime I say I need guitar strings, she says, you better get on Amazon. We are not doing that again. But it's amazing to think about this idea of wanting nothing. Because when we think about that in our modern terms, there's, there, there's all kinds of things that we want. I mean, some of y'all want lunch right now. I just started. 
We want things, right? We want things all the time. But I like the version where it says, I lack nothing. Because what this really means is that God gives us what we need. Now, we might debate with God at times what we think we need. But God is concerned not just with our physical bodies, but with our eternal souls. We are given all we need to be persons of faith. We're given everything we need to be faithful, to love God, to love each other, to fulfill the purpose that God has given us, to be disciples and followers of Jesus, to be the people who do the work of the kingdom. We lack nothing. But we'd be lying if we said we didn't sometimes wander away from the providence that God gives us. Like sheep, we are prone to wander. One of the things that I struggle with very often, even as your pastor, is I struggle with this idea of always being faithful. There are moments where I struggle with my faithfulness. I don't know how many of you have ever struggled with faithfulness, but there are moments where I am absolutely distracted from my faith. There are moments where I am taken away from doing what is good because I'm focused on things that are really just not helpful. And in those moments, I'm not the husband I want to be. I'm not the father I want to be. I'm not the friend I want to be. I'm not the pastor I want to be. I'm not the person I want to be. Because even as your pastor, there are seasons I wander from God. There are seasons where I feel distance between me and God. There are seasons where I just don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And what's amazing in those seasons, and you would think at some point I would learn, but like I've established before, we are sheep and we are dumb. I always struggle with remembering what it takes to bring it back. And very often what it takes to bring it back is to be about the work of pouring into my faith. Jesus was famous for saying, seek and you will find, knock, the doors will be open for you, ask and you will get answers. How often do we sit around and go, I don't know what to do, and just do nothing? What's amazing about lacking nothing is that if we decide to follow the shepherd, we'll have what we need. We may not understand what God is giving us. We may look at what God has given us and go, Lord, why are you giving me this right now? And we may not understand the blessing that we're receiving. We may feel like our blessing is a curse. The Beatitudes kind of challenge us that way, right? What's amazing about God is that God is always with us, walking with us, guiding us, strengthening us, giving us what we need. And when we're with God, we lack nothing. The psalmist goes on to say that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his own name's sake. That, always, that line always made me stumble because I always wondered, what does it mean to, to do it for his own name's sake? And I was like, is, is this something about God being proud of what he does and showing off? But no, it's God saying that I'm going to be faithful to you and I'm going to lead you on paths of righteousness, not because God is proud, but because God has put his name behind us. God has said, those are mine and he's going to guide us and his own good name has been put up beside ours. He loves us that much. And it's amazing to think about it when you think about this idea that God loves us enough to walk with us. And the psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so we have to wonder about this idea of what it means to have God giving us this provision and this comfort, this gift of love and of kindness and of mercy. And I think about that when I read this psalm, this gift of God being there with us even when we walk through the darkest moments. 
I don't know if any of you have ever walked through dark moments, but as I said before, Psalm 23 is read during funerals. It's also read at the bedside of those who are dying. And Psalm 23 is one of those psalms that I have a lot of memories around, but some of my hardest memories in ministry happened with this psalm. The hardest memory I have in ministry was the burial of my grandfather, Papa Rule, the United Methodist preacher. Pop was an incredible man, and one of the things he did before he died, he knew he had cancer, he knew he had some other issues, he knew that his mind was being affected by the cancer that he had, and he came to our house one, one time with, uh, with all the kids, and he came and he brought me a gift, and he handed me a book. And that book was entitled The Funeral Encyclopedia. Not a morbid gift, not, not a morbid gift, Pop, not a morbid gift at all. But he always had a book when he wanted to teach me something that mattered. He always gave me a book and he always said, now you might not read this, but I need to talk to you about something. And as he gave me that book, he looked at me and he said, David... I have done my best to teach you how to live as a Christian, and some of it even took. <laughs> Pop was the best. And he said, Dave, I've got to teach you how to die like a Christian, and it's going to be okay. Don't be afraid. Fear no evil. God is with us. And even though I tried not to have any fear and to rejoice at my grandfather's triumphal entry into heaven, when it came time to commend his body to the earth, I had performed his funeral. I had gotten to the last moment, and I couldn't do it. Couldn't say goodbye. My throat tightened. Must have been some dust in my eye somewhere or something. I'm kidding. I was crying. Like a kid who dropped his ice cream at, on the playground. Like ugly crying. I couldn't speak. I couldn't look up. I couldn't hardly breathe. And my grandmother's voice rang out. It's okay, Dave. Pop knows you love him. It's going to be all right. My father got up and tried to help me, and he couldn't do it. So our clergy friends who had done thousands of funerals, who were there with us at that funeral, all in unison, started saying the, the liturgy for the committal of a body to the ground together. And it felt like the entire group there said the words together, because what was too hard for one or two of us to do, all of us came together to do. And I think about this idea of being the flock of God, of having God walk with us even through the darkest valleys because part of what God provides us is God's people. He's the good shepherd, but we're given the gift of being a part of the flock. We're given the gift of being a part of the God's people. We're given the gift of having people we can lean on and rely on. We're being given the gift of having people who will love us through even the brokenness of moments. Jesus, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 30, his disciples had been doing all kinds of incredible things. They had been going out on a mission and they had been sent out by Jesus to do incredible things, and they had been working hard. And the scripture says this, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told Jesus all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. One of the things Jesus realized in that moment as our good shepherd is there's going to come times where we're out of gas. We are just plumb tired. Have you all been exhausted? Ever? No? Well, good. I know who to ask to do stuff. I've been tired before. 
When I was a baby pastor in Seal, Alabama, we had a little bitty church that had about five kids coming to it. And one of our church council meetings, they decided that we needed to have a children's ministry. And they voted that we were going to have a children's ministry. And I, I dumbly voted to in agreement with them. And then after the meeting was over, my staff parish chairman came to me and said, all right, how are you going to do this children's ministry? I want you to think about that wording. How are you going to do this children's ministry? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we voted. Now you got to do it. Okay. So I did what any sensible man would do. I asked my wife, what do we do? We had become, it had gone from me to we very quick, right? And Brittany helped, and I remember we were begging for volunteers to come and be with us, and we could get someone to show up every week to be safe sanctuaries volunteers, but we were struggling to get people to really dedicate to work with these children. And there were five children, and then it became six children and seven children, and it started slowly growing. And we had a UMW meeting. And one of the things that they don't tell you when you become a pastor is that uh, whether you want to be or not, you are a United Methodist woman. That's in their bylaws. If you're a pastor, you're a part of the team. And I went to a United Methodist women's meeting, and I had an agenda. They said, preacher, you don't normally come to these. I said, well, first of all, I always come for the snacks. And second of all, I have, a, I have an ask. And they said, what is that? Now, the United Methodist Women exist to help women and children. That's what they're for. That's what those groups exist for. And I went to that group and I said, I need help. Because we have children who need to be discipled. And I am just not enough. I need you. And that day, I was told by everyone at that meeting, when I had kids, I was very active in children's ministry. It's someone else's turn. The average age of that congregation was 87. There was no one to take that turn. And so finally, one sweet lady the youngest of the group relented. And she said, I'll help you because it matters. And that group of 10 kids grew to 20 kids. And that group of 20 kids turned into a 50-kid vacation Bible school. And it was amazing watching the Spirit of God fill that place. And a church that had not really heard the soft patter of children's feet throughout the, its halls for years was now worried about how do you keep the children out of the dangerous stuff. My favorite trustees meeting was, we're not upset they broke it. However, we do have to replace it. That was the best meeting ever. They broke a bunch of antique chairs. And I remember vividly the Spirit of God taking up that place because people decided that they were going to come together and work together. But they had decided that they weren't going to continue resting when there was work to be done. Jesus did give his disciples permission to rest he gives us permission to rest he gave them permission to rest and to take the solace they needed to restore their souls he led them literally out onto still water and gave them an opportunity to be in a deserted place where the hustle and bustle of the crowd and people's needs were not all around them he gave them the opportunity to gather their wits and be who God needed them to be to go and retreat to that place and Jesus did that often he would go to a deserted place and pray he would get away from the crowd and take a breath one of my favorite t-shirts some of the staff wear it says Jesus took naps be like Jesus it's this idea that you got to rest sometime but you also have to get back to work. What's amazing about Jesus' disciples is that they never quit working. They never retired. There was no such thing as retirement from being a disciple. They retired when they died. Some of them didn't get to live to a ripe old age. Some of them were martyred. And they served God up unto their death. They wrote letters from prisons to make sure that the work of God continued going forward. They taught prison guards about faith. They did incredible things even as their life was ending. The Apostle Paul was notorious. He sang hymns on the way to getting his head cut off. Like this is a man who just glorified God with everything he had, with every breath he had, with every moment he had. Peter 
was crucified. And as the story tells us, he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be killed the same way Jesus was. But he wanted to be faithful and to be a servant of the one who loved him. They were literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death and they feared no evil. They would take breaks, they would restore themselves, and they would get back to work. One of the things that I struggle with with Christians so often is that they'll work for a season and then they'll take a much longer season off. But as I have to tell my kids, it's time to start waking up early again. Summer's almost over. It's time to get back at it, to get ready to work, to get ready to get back to doing the things that God calls us to do. Yes, Jesus wants his disciples to rest, but to rest for a purpose, to rest to get back to doing what God calls us to do. And the psalmist is amazing. He, told, he's, he tells us that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and that we'll dwell in the house of the Lord for our entire lives. Jesus, when he and his disciples got off the boat, they got right back to work. The scripture tells us, beginning in verse 53 of chapter 6 of Mark, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, cities, or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The world needs hope. It needs help. It needs goodness. It needs mercy. And if we want to see those happen, those things happen, we have to be willing to be about the work of God. Psalm 23 is a psalm of providence. It's a psalm where we're told that we're given everything we need. It's a psalm that tells us that we have nothing to fear. And what's amazing about Jesus is that he lived into that psalm. He was the good shepherd. He has given us everything we need. He has given us the power of eternal life. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us the encourager, the leader, the advocate. He has given us all we need to be about the work of the kingdom of God. And I can tell you there are so many opportunities for us to speak our faith into this world that we as followers of Christ just seem to miss at times. But we have opportunities to share God's goodness and mercy with this world. We have opportunities to give back to God out of gratitude for what God has done for us because God has given us grace that can never be taken away. God has given us everlasting life. God has given us hope. And it's a hope that never runs out because God walks with us in brokenness and struggle. God walks with us when we're facing things that others might view as curses, but Jesus calls them blessings. Read the Beatitudes. It's crazy. Jesus tells us we're all kinds of blessed when we face all kinds of hardship. It's amazing. Jesus tells us that we're called to show people how to be Christians in the midst of brokenness. Just as my grandfather said, I'll show you how to die like a Christian. We're called to show the world how to bear the burdens that exist in this broken and fallen in the world as Christians, as people of hope. That doesn't mean we're not going to need help from time to time. That doesn't mean we're not going to have bad days. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have days where all of our Christian brothers and sisters are going to have to come around us and pray for us and help us and give us the strength we need to accomplish what God is calling us to accomplish. But what it means is that we don't forget who is with us that the shepherd is always there, guiding us, sustaining us, leading us to the still waters. In ancient Judea, that path, that when he talks about green grass and still waters, ancient Judea was a lot like modern Middle East. It hadn't changed much. Those green pastures were not abundant like Florida grass. They weren't growing, it seems like, five inches a minute. 
making my HOA very angry. Those green pastures were places that had to be carefully tended. You had to make sure you moved the flocks around and take them to a new green pasture so they didn't overgraze and kill all the grass. You had to make sure that you guided your flock around. Those still waters on a day like today in Judea where thunderstorms abound, those waters are anything but still. Because in that arid climate, when it rains, that water runs down like a rushing river and just floods the region. We've seen that in, in the spring. In the spring, all kinds of Middle Eastern countries were flooding because of the rain. Because the rivers would flood when thunderstorms would occur and it would stir the water up. Sweep everything away with it. God's telling us that he's giving us providence that won't let us be swept away. He's making sure that we have enough to be sustained. He's making sure that our life of faith has all it needs to be successful. That doesn't mean we're going to have everything we want. I'm living proof. I only have a few guitars. Not all of them yet. Jamel's got me beat. but I have everything I need. I have everything I need to live out my faith. I have everything I need to face the adversity that comes my way. I have a family that loves me and that I love. I have a church family that loves me and that I love. I have friends who walk with me. I have colleagues that walk with me. I have people that check on me. I have people that can even read my mood when I walk into a room. And they'll look at me and go, you okay? And even if it's just a minor annoyance, they'll give me encouragement. I have everything I need to be who God calls me to be. And yet I still find myself worrying I still stay up half the night on Saturday nights worried the sermon's not going to be good enough. I still don't eat on Sunday mornings because I'm so nervous. And when I finished preaching, the first thing I asked Brittany was, did that make sense? And she'll tell me yes. But I think inside she really wants to mess with me and go, no. But God gives us all we need. That still, calm voice of God calls each and every one of us. And as I'm laying awake on Saturday night, I always feel that peace of God overcome me. And say, you're enough. You're doing what you were called to do. Go and do it. And I think that each and every one of us in this room have access to that still, calm voice. But we have to let the shepherd lead us. We have to be willing to receive the grace given to us. And we have to be willing to have our souls restored, not just for our leisure, but for a purpose. To let God use us. So that we can help others come and experience the green pastures, the still waters, and the restoration of their souls. But it takes all of us walking together as God's people, as God's family, sharing hope with the world as we invite others to be a part of our family. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this chance to come and to be a part of what you were doing in this church and in this world. We pray, God, that you would guide us and strengthen us, that you would give us hope, that you would help us as you provide for us and sustain us and restore us to see where you're calling us to go. Lead us, Lord. Show us where we are called to be and as your faithful flock, God, help us to fulfill your holy purpose. Help us to use our lives as a living sacrifice, an offering to you in the hopes that we might love you in some small way as a reflection of the love you've given us. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.
Please stand as you are able and as we, children of God, profess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. to introduce you to, I hope, what shows up on the screen here. <coughs> that is Hamilton, and that is Harry. These are the offering bots in our children's ministry program. Our youngest disciples are being taught that God gives to us and we give back to God. I don't know what they see in the K through five area on Sunday morning, but my preschoolers love to feed Harry every Sunday morning. They love to stick their hand right inside of his nose and almost suck it up in there. And I want to present to you, and actually just present to God today, over the last couple of months, they are presenting back to God and to this church for use in this community, $50. As the ushers come forward, let us pray. Gracious God, we present to you our offerings humbly. Use them to bless your kingdom in this world. Amen.
And if you would, please turn to hymn number 140, Great is Thy Faith. Thank you. 